Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. So welcome all you all to, to this webinar dedicated to the big DFT code. This webinar has this title, the flexibility of wavelets for electronic structure calculations in large systems. So this is the last of a series of seven webinars organized by the Max Center of Excellence. These webinars cover the most of the features of the main codes, the flagship codes of the Max Consortium. And I invite you, in case you are interested or you missed some of them, to go to the Max Center uh, website where the material associated to with these webinars can be re vis uh, revisualized and uh, 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 where all these videos are recorded, including the one which uh, is following. So today, as I have already anticipated, we are discussing about one of the codes of the MAX consortium, the big DFT code, which uh, already you have seen in the title, is a code that is based on the wavelet formalisms. So uh, the aim of this webinar is to present the peculiarities of this formalism and the way in which we, as the Big DFT Developers Consortium, have been thinking uh, as been, uh, about uh, how to employ this formalism in the context of the electronic structure calculation based on DFT. So uh, this uh, uh, presentation uh, in this context will be mainly based on uh, uh, the illustration of uh, uh, the features of the formalism and the way in which we have been used it in the last years. So uh, the following webinar will be structured by three main uh, 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 subjects, three main chapters, we can call like that. In the first chapter, uh, Thierry and me and myself will be uh, uh, presenting, will present the, the basics of the formalism, the main ideas which led us in the direction of employing uh, wavelets for DFT, and uh, 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 to have a small historical perspective of what was the uh, reasons that led us to the big DFT project. Uh, then uh, there will be the time for a small wrap-up section in case uh, you would like to already ask uh, some of the questions to us. Uh, after this small question session, we can then uh, pass to the second stage of this webinar, where we are mainly focusing our discussion on the large-scale calculations that big DFT formalism enable. Uh, Laura and William will present uh, how these new potentialities, new features can uh, uh, drive challenges in uh, uh, this field. And we will try to draw some uh, 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 conclusions or some point of view that we are kind of addressing in our present uh, scientific uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, then after this part, there will be the third part. Well, we will have a, a brief outlook of what, what is the software approach that uh, uh, Big DFT proposes, especially in the context of high performance computing. And uh, uh, I will then try to uh, uh, wrap up a little the main messages that have been presented during uh, this webinar we will have hopefully some time for a final question session at the end of, uh, of the event. So uh, uh, as uh, I have anticipated, the main idea beyond the Big DFT project is to implement and test uh, new ideas based on DFT calculations, thanks to this formalism, which uh, is enabled by the properties of wavelets. So uh, there will be, during uh, the talk, some questions uh, you will be asked to answer, if you want, uh, that may uh, help us in understanding uh, which could be the interest of the audience on which kind of functionalities that Big DFT make possible uh, are potentially useful uh, for, for the community. 
So I think it's time to, to start and uh, I, uh, I leave the word to, uh, to Thierry to present why and how Big DFT has been conceived uh, more than 10 years ago. And thank you and enjoy the seminar. Okay, thank you, Luigi. So I share my screen. Okay, so I will present you the base of Big DFT code. So in uh, the Big DFT, uh, then um, what is important is, uh, well, as you know, we have two main classes of wave functions, which are used to calculate the electronic structure. The one that emerged for solids in the 90s were the plane waves used uh, by Habini, CPMD, VASP, and many other codes. Accuracy increases with the number of elements in the basis set depending on a single parameter, the famous cutoff energy. Plane waves form a systematic basis set. It is non-localized because it is a Fourier space. Basis set and is optimal for periodic systems, especially, especially homogeneous ones. Uh, the main problem with uh, plane waves is is not adaptive using the same resolution everywhere in the box, even where there are no uh, electrons. The strong advantage of plane wave is a fast Fourier transform, which allows to go from direct space to Fourier space and vice versa. This algorithm has made the success of plane waves in our community robust and easy to parallelize. On the other hand, the Gaussian functions used by CP2K, Gaussian, AMPO, TurboMol, etc., need a small number of basis functions for an, for an already remarkable accuracy. It is very well adapted for molecules and open systems. However, it does not have only one parameter to quantify its accuracy and requires know-how and experience. Its advantage is that the calculation of the overlap matrices and the kinetic operator are analytical. Parallelizing a code based on Gaussian function is difficult because even if these functions are localized, it is not so easy to locate the different operators applying to them. So when we launch, when we launch uh, the big DFT project in 2005, we wanted the best of these two basis sets to have a systematic basis set localized in real space and easily parallelized. To do this, we use wavelets, notably Dobeshi wavelets, which are orthogonal to each other. Since the version 1.0 of Big DFT in 2008, we have shown that wavelets are capable of being so precise, allowing us to develop a linear scanning method for calculating large systems in very precise ways and above all, this has enabled us to test new ideas and develop new tools. I explain quickly what a wavelet is. They appeared in the mid 80s and have been applied in many fields, particularly in density functional theory. So Debussy wavelets are localized in real space, smooth, which allows a good localization also in Fourier space, and this is really important for the convergence of many algorithms and uh, the wavelets are orthogonal. We can build a multi-resolution basis set and adaptive. That means the resolution varies at different points in space as shown in the figure at the top right and finally, finally systematic. At the bottom of uh, the slide, you can see two components of a family of wavelets the scaling function in red and the famous wavelet in blue dotted, which give details at a finer resolution. Quickly, a multi-resolution base is built in real space by placing scaling function centered on a grid of points. These functions have a compact support which allow us local spatial calculation. The scaling function has the particularity of having a scaling relation with itself. The scaling function is a linear combination of the same scaling function translated many times on at a finer resolution. For example, the simplest scaling function is a rectangular function in blue, which is a sum of two rectangular functions of twice the resolution in red. 
Note that these small gate functions are on a grid that is twice as fine uh, centered on the light gray dots. In combination with the scaling function, the wavelet function can be used to add the details at a finer scale. In the case of, uh, of the rectangular function, the corresponding wavelet is a grid function uh, of a gate function at the top plus a gate function at the bottom. So you can see also that the small rectangular function on a fine gray grid can be expressed by the scaling function and the wavelet function on the coarse grid of black dots. So this is really important. This means that by keeping the coarse grid on with two functions at each point, a scaling function and a wavelet function, the same, the same level of detail can be expressed as on the fine grid without changing the step of the grid. So thanks to this trick, the grid can be adapted by choosing according to the location of the atoms, the places where the resolution associated with the wavelet is kept in order to have finer details. In the case of big DFT, because we use pseudo potential, we have only two levels of resolution. In 3D, on each point of the grid, it is not two, but eight functions to be considered, two cube, that we will have to express a finer resolution. Automatically, the program defines a spherical region around each atom. You can see the example of the water molecule on the side, where the eight functions will be kept. Then a second region where there will be only one function per grid point. Finally, apart from a region defined by spheres centered on the atoms, no points are considered. So there is no need for a supercell as in the case of Pengo. So to build our 3D basis set, we make the tensor product of either, either a scaling function or a wavelet in the X, Y, and Z directions, which makes eight different types of function, two cube. We have chosen Dobushi's wavelet for their orthogonality property to describe Kohn-Sham orbitals, which simplifies the implementation of the code. Finally, we would like to insist on this point. The Dobushi's wavelet in particular are defined by a scaling relation that links the scaling function from one resolution to a finer resolution. It is the filters AJ in the red value that define the wavelets. They are known analytically and are manipulated to calculate all the quantities needed for the calculation. Thus, in our case, the precision behaves like the grid step at the power 14, which allows grid steps of the order of 0.2 uh, angstroms to be used. We express the function like the orbitals on our scaling and wavelength functions. Then all the basic operations are expressed as convolution. Another advantage, uh, like, like, the, sorry, like the kinetic operator, uh, as you can see, uh, which is calculated analytically according to the filters AJ. Another advantage that we exploit for pseudo potentials on potion solver, so Luigi uh, discussed about that, is the use of separable functions like Gaussian, which require not n cube calculations, but only three n integrals calculations. We use pseudo potential of the GTH and AGH type for this reason. So the basic set of big DFT uh, uh, using uh, in big DFT, the wavelets is systematic with two parameters to adjust its accuracy, the grid step and the extension of the grid around the molecules. We show for the methane molecule on the slide, the total energy surface of the system as a function uh, of these parameters where the desired precision can be achieved. So it's really important to extend the extension of the grid and to decrease the, the grid step. Thanks to the ad adaptability of the mesh, big DFT is optimal for computing inhomogeneous systems such as molecules. If we compare the number of degrees of freedom needed to calculate a molecule, we can see that a wavelet code as big DFT reduces the number of degrees of freedom by an order of magnitude for the same precision, which saves time, an order of magnitude, but also memory. 
As we have free boundary conditions, we can easily calculate charge systems in contrast to plane waves. We have chosen uh, to use pseudo potential to limit the number of resolution levels. We have shown that by incorporating a simple nonlinear core correction, so a simple analytic form, without increasing the harness of the pseudo potential, we can achieve the accuracy of an all electron code for different quantities in different environments. So the primary objectives of the big DFT project was to be able to develop a linear scaling code where the computation time is, a, is linear with the number of atoms and not cubic scaling, as it is the case with plane waves and Gaussian functions. To do this, the different operator and the density matrix must be sparse. For this, we have introduced support functions, which are localized around the atoms developed in wavelets and optimized during the calculations. We then express the cone sham orbitals with this support function and no longer directly on the wavelets. We show a molecule on the left with its cone sham orbitals and on the, the famous support function which allow us to express the cone sham orbitals. The density matrix is then expressed according to this support function with a kernel K alpha beta matrix. As the support functions are located around the atom, their overlap is only between neighboring atoms, so that the density matrix is sparse. We have local quantities to compute using our compact support wavelet, and we have sparse matrices to manipulate or invert, which allow us to have a linear scaling method. A considerable advantage is that we optimize during the calculation these famous support functions to reach the same precision as the cubic scaling code. So the scheme for the linear scaling version is therefore as follows. We start from an atomic type orbitals. We optimize our basis set of support function on our wavelets. For that, we minimize the constraint Kunsham Hamiltonian. Then we minimize on this basis set the Kunsham orbitals and we iterate. It has been shown that this gives very accurate results comparing to the cubic scaling code. Thanks to the construction of these support functions, no Poulet forces have to be considered. So to finish this part, thanks to the wavelets, we have a flexible formalism which allows us to calculate systems with all kinds of boundary conditions isolated, surface, periodic, wires, and without the need to make corrections such as a shard system. So we show, for instance, in the figure uh, at the bottom, uh, the associated potential of the, on a shard surface. We have a systematic approach where we take into account the relevant degrees of freedom, which allow us to make calculations that were difficult to envisage before. No, I think Luigi will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Thierry. I will now share my uh, second seminar. So I hope you can see it. Uh, so hello again. Uh, so after, uh, oops, I am sorry. I perhaps didn't share the good the good part of the screen. Yep. This should be the correct one. Can you see the... Nope. I'm so sorry. That's the nice part of being live. There you go. Okay. Um, so, as Thierry has already presented, the main ideas which lied beyond the wavelet uh, choice of, you, of expressing a DFT uh, formalism, uh, I will now uh, dig a little more into the uh, 
real space approach that uh, big DFT provides. So you may have realized already having, an, uh, having a look at the re seminar that uh, Dobeshi's wavelet are they, as they are compactly supported are uh, more, more uh, associated to a real space basis rather than a reciprocal space one. So in this extension, they are more similar to finite elements than to plane waves. That is also a reason why, thanks to wavelets, it is potentially possible to develop a real space approach for expressing some of the consham operators in the different, uh, in the different uh, context of the DFT. So, uh, uh, strictly speaking, in Big DFT, we are employing the Dobeshi's wavelets to express the consham orbitals or the support functions, the functions that enable the, the linear scaling approach of Big DFT. But we employ also another set of functions that go under the name of interpolating scaling functions uh, for all the operators that are associated to real space. And in that I am referring to the local pseudopotential, the local part of the pseudopotential, the local potential, and the solution of the Poisson equation that is ba uh, basics for any kind of de uh, density functional theory algorithm. The, uh, there is a, a clever and uh, fundamental way to express the real space coefficients of a wave function in real in Dobeshi's that is enabled by the magic filter method that has been developed prior to the beginning of the big DFT project by Stefan Gudecker's group. And that is a very important method that is on the ground basis of making a density functional theory calculation on Dobeshi is possible. So in this context, in this presentation, I would like to give you some ideas on why the uh, uh, Dobeshi's wavelet formalism is kind of uh, uh, prone to be used in the context of high performance calculations, high performance computing calculations. So I will mainly discuss of the operations that are associated to the Hamiltonian, uh, um, the density, the Consham Hamiltonian application on the uh, Consham orbitals by explaining the considerations that led us in the idea of developing a code with a mindset that is already uh, 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 prone to high performance computing approaches. So here in this cartoon, one can see that indeed the Dobeshi's wavelets uh, are not the only uh, uh, basis functions which are used as I have already anticipated for all the parts that are associated to the real space potential, we employ interpolating scaling functions that are a function, I will try to show you why, which is very, very useful to express uh, local potentials and in particular the Poisson solver approach. So in this context, uh, uh, let's uh, just recall a brief history. We are in the beginning of a big DFT project. We are at early 2010. Uh, uh, general purpose GPU computing was about to start. Uh, uh, and actually we had the possibility, we had at hand a formalism that uh, is actually very well suited to be accelerated via GPUs. So since the advent of double precision GP GPU, we have been thinking on expressing Dobeshi's wavelets degrees of freedom and related uh, into the GPU approach. So of course, in this uh, uh, context, I will not explain in detail which were the operation which were done and the advantages that this operation brought in the execution of a DFT code. But yet it is important to understand that this formalism were uh, very interesting as a case study, as a, a, a tool to exploit GPU acceleration in the future, in, in the community.
So we have been among the first DFT codes uh, employing systematic basis sets that uh, could benefit from this technology. And since then, uh, uh, since the beginning of the project, actually, uh, we were testing this approach onto a various set of architectures in the context of high HPC supercomputers. So once again, I will not enter here into the details, but it is important to, to know uh, which were the guidelines that have to be considered in the context of testing a new formalism into a new architecture. So the points uh, which uh, are listed here uh, in the top box are uh, more or less points that uh, any developer on accelerated architecture should ask himself. The point is, is the formalism uh, well suited for the architectures I would like to test the formalism into? How much manpower I would need to port these formalism into an architecture. We could no, not always rely on vendors' libraries and the, the wavelets convolution is an example. I will try to give you some ideas about that. Also, when an accelerator is available, should I always use it? And uh, how the accelerated results have to be interpreted? Of course, if I have only small number of accelerators and lots of degrees of freedom, what is the aim I should like to, uh, to, uh, uh, to bring to my uh, production calculations. So uh, these uh, questions, I am sure, are questions that uh, all of you in the audience uh, uh, have uh, thought about in the context of uh, uh, high performance computing and GP GPUs. And these questions bring uh, evaluations at different levels. So uh, the speed up of the operation I have ported is a reference data that will not always correspond to the speed up of the full code, especially when the full code is parallelized in an environment that takes into account uh, software stacks that superpose each other. So of course, uh, these are uh, uh, general considerations and I will not try to enter into these details today, but it's important to take that into account because uh, it is not only about uh, Porting, which yet is a challenging, uh, uh, a challenging task, and I would like just to show you some historical perspective of this task that uh, we have been, uh, uh, we needed to face uh, uh, at the time. So we had a convolution. So this is a convolution which have uh, formalism, uh, formally the same shape of uh, the magic filter convolution. I have just briefly mentioned before. And this convolution need to be optimized in an architecture. So we do not have a library to deal with. At least we didn't have at the time. In any case, uh, we needed to write this convolution explicitly. So we had to do manual optimization operation at the beginning of the project. And this manual optimization operation corresponds to the reference implementation that we have employed to then accelerate. Now, one can realize that uh, uh, by using new architectures, this is an old table we have presented in other occasions associated to the big DFT uh, presentations, uh, by using another architectures like the old Fermi GPU, uh, with a moderate amount of manpower, one could reach a acceleration that would not have been possible to be reached with traditional architectures. So that brings us to what was the second point of the previous slide. So how much manpower should I need to port a solution into an accelerator. So uh, uh, eventually, it's always a trade-off between the benefit and the effort. That's, of course, it's a kind of a meaning meaningless phrase when you said by that. The point is that if one wants to perform manual optimization, this manual optimization should always be ad adapted to the architecture uh, in case a new architecture would come. Uh, 
so that was the main idea that brought us to the idea of the boast engine that is uh, one of the tool we are actually employing within the context of the max consortium to perform a maintainable and efficient approach to accelerate our operations on the gpus what is the boast engine just a simple presentation here shows that the idea of a boast is to meta program the sources I have briefly presented in the beginning. So the idea is to actually have a generative source code instead of a source code that can generate automatically in a new architectures combination of optimization that could then be employed in the new architecture and combine that with a, a, a selection of the best version for a given uh, uh, particular uh, uh, supercomputer. So this is an example that, of course, uh, is rich of details, and uh, uh, we are, of course, available in case you would like to know a little more, um, that would bring to a more efficient optimization of uh, uh, the, uh, the convolution without having to pay every time the complicated manpower effort that would be needed. So. Uh, the point is, thanks to that, we can now develop a kind of a library associated to the convolutions that, of course, is mainly tailored for Dobesh's wavelet, but can, only, can also employ other wavelet families that uh, is uh, somehow accelerated and uh, optimized kind of automatically by this idea of metaprogramming. So, the take home message of this section of the talk is that not all the codes, unfortunately, can benefit from vendor libraries or vendor optimized libraries. Big DFT, in the fact that it's a new formalism, can't use these benefits in the context of HPC. So BOST is one of the attempts we have been trying to uh, uh, somehow generate efficient and optimized codes. So that was the part associated to the convolution. So in the small time I have, I would like, this is a slide I would like to skip. Uh, I would like to uh, just briefly discuss about another real space operation that is in the big DFT code, which is the Poisson solver. So the interpolating scaling function operate, uh, uh, func uh, basis set is optimal for electrostatic problems and can develop explicitly a, a, a direct approach to solve the Poisson equation in the various boundary conditions. We have the possibility, thanks to this basis set, to employ free boundary condition, fully isolated, as well as surface boundary condition, wires-like boundary condition, fully periodic boundary condition, that of course is a traditional approach. So uh, this solver has been benchmarked by uh, our other pair people in our community, and it has already shown excellent features of precision, as well as uh, 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 parallel performance. Uh, again, once again, this is a mindset that is related to HPC uh, calculations. Uh, the advantage of this solver is that it can also be GPU accelerated. We have made uh, a, a work that uh, showed that with such kind of techniques, one can directly, without approximation, uh, enable uh, complicated hybrid functional calculations with lots of consham orbitals with a, a, a time to solution that is within the same order of magnitude of semi-local exchange and correlation functional. So uh, this is an approach where once again, one can see that uh, a GPU acceleration can trigger new physics and new potentialities uh, uh, thanks to flexibility of the approach. So uh, uh, in uh, my last uh, slides, I would like just to uh, uh, also say that uh, uh, this formalism is also well suited to do implicit solvents calculation and then to generalize the boundary conditions that uh, so far have been considered uh, presented only in vacuum. So we employ within this solver a, a preconditioned conjugate gradient algorithm that uh, uh, some 
uh, is able to find the solution of the generalized Poisson equation in a cavity that is again expressed efficiently in these interpolating scaling function basis. Uh, so uh, this is a solution that enable us to express uh, uh, with non-trivial boundary conditions uh, uh, solution of the Concham problem. Uh, polarizable systems as well as uh, uh, systems in uh, non-fully uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions can benefit from, uh, from, this, uh, from this treatment. Uh, and also with a time to solution that is compatible with vacuum calculation. Here we can see that uh, we, with a thousand, a thousand, a hundred atom system, we could reach the solution of the self-consistent cycle in a small overhead with respect to the full, uh, the full uh, vacuum uh, solution. So to wrap up, that ends my uh, presentation. I have been focused a little more on the fact that wavelets are kind of prone to high performance computing if one address the problem in the correct way. So these, uh, the main part of the code that benefit from this acceleration are the convolutions, which led us to the development of the techniques like the Bost ones, and the Poisson solver that uh, uh, enables uh, a very precise treatment of uh, the Poisson equation, even with generalized, uh, generalized solvent. So uh, uh, the idea is to obtain a formalist that can provide at the same time uh, uh, a good compromise between uh, efficiency in the calculation and the precision of the result, as well as with a systematic uh, mindset and approach. So this concludes my presentation. And uh, as I have anticipated in the beginning, uh, there may be a few seconds for uh, a question. Uh, so I have I saw that there is a question in the chat. So in the, in the Q and A section about uh, the uh, GW implementation on the daisies. Uh, here again, I think it's important to, to remind that there are two levels in which uh, uh, the solution of a given uh, problem can be expressed. The first one is the pure wavelet level, in which case we would have a number of degrees of freedom that is. Uh, compatible more with a plane wave approach than with a Gaussian or localized basis function approach. In the sense that, as Thierry said, we save the degrees of freedom where it is needed, yet we have few thousands of degrees of freedom per atom in this context. The result would be unbiased, but yet we have a large number of basis function. Another point is the localized support function basis, which enable the linear scaling algorithm of big DFT. And for this, we have a very few degrees of freedom per atom, not more than uh, uh, four to 10, depending on the system. So it may be interesting indeed to compare when the one formalism is needed or not, in the context of post-DFT calculation. Uh, to answer the question, we have made a prototype implementation of a GW calculation in 2013 based on pure wavelets. And we are actually going in the direction of post-DFT calculation with constrained DFT approaches. So uh, uh, the challenges are mainly associated to our present scientific priorities. Uh, we have made a, tent, uh, a, a prototype implementation uh, uh, for the moment. Uh, uh, there are no reason I see uh, to prevent these implementation also for the linear scaling approach. So I hope this answers the questions, but uh, I'm also available for, for future, uh, future clarifications. So I think we could move to the, to the second section of the seminar. Uh, I think uh, it's Laura's uh, talk. So I let her share the screen and, uh, and continue the presentation. I don't know if. Hi. Uh... 
sorry, somehow I lost my Zoom window. Uh, try again. Um, sorry, one moment. <laughs> Hopefully you should now be able to see my talk. Um, yes. Okay, great. So um, as uh, Luigi uh, already anticipated, so I'm going to be talking particularly about the applications and our approach that we take to treating large systems in big DFT. Um, from the, the ground state initially, and I'm going to finish with talking a bit about uh, some perspective on excited states in big DFT. So as uh, Thierry already mentioned, um, the, one of the original goals of the big DFT project was to have a linear scaling uh, implementation. But in the first instance, the standard approach just using the Dolbashi's wavelets as a basis set is cubic scaling as in, in common with plane wave codes, for example. So thanks to the efficient properties of wavelets and the, the parallelization that we have, we're able to treat up to about a thousand atoms. But as you can see uh, in, in these two figures, we start to hit uh, the cubic scaling limit for both the computer time and for memory, in this case for a system of graphene. And particularly because of memory, more than a thousand atoms becomes uh, very difficult to achieve uh, and certainly not much more than that. Uh, so if we want to do much bigger systems and both myself and William will be showing some examples uh, of why we might be interested in doing uh, bigger systems than a, a thousand atoms, we need a new approach. But one of the things which is known is that the behavior of large systems is, is short ranged or nearsighted. And in particular, the density matrix decays exponentially with, in systems with a gap. Um, and so the question is, can we exploit nearsightedness in large systems? Well, the answer is uh, yes. <laughs> and in fact, we're not the first people to do this. So as Thierry already, uh, gave you a, a preview of, we can re-express the cone sham orbitals as some linear combination of support functions. And this is a, a similar approach to what is adopted in, for example, the, the one-tep or, or the conquest codes, um, which are, also have a linear scaling approach. Um, but the idea is instead of going from something delocalized, we instead have these localized atom-centered quantities. And so this means we still have our, our two levels of uh, wavelet underlying grid resolution, but we now also have these spherical regions imposed on top. And so just to, to emphasize that these support functions, although they, they tend to be SPD-like, so they resemble atomic orbitals in some way, they are in fact purely numerical functionals, uh, numerical functions. And usually we make the choice that they're quasi-orthogonal. And as Thierry already mentioned, once we have these support functions, we can write the density matrix in terms of the support functions and density kernel. And from then on, we usually work in terms of matrix operations, either using, for example, the Hamiltonian matrix in the support function basis or the overlap matrix. Um, and once we have these uh, support functions, uh, we then have this uh, algorithm that, that Thierry already discussed. Um, but the key point here to notice here is that the support functions adapt to their environment. So we optimize them using some minimization approach with uh, some constraints. And this means that, that, as you can see in this example, uh, the orbitals associated with carbon atoms look slightly different depending on which uh, atom they're on uh, because of they having different local chemical environments. We also have three different methods implemented for optimizing the density kernel. So for this second loop uh, in our uh, algorithm. So the, the main one that we use for linear scaling calculations is the Fermi operator expansion, but we also have a direct minimization and diagonalization approach. And the direct minimization approach is particularly useful in cases where we need to have a few virtual states represented by the basis. Because typically, if you use the Fermi operator expansion, you can only expect that the occupied states will be well represented by the support function basis. And then we can also calculate the forces very accurately, and this allows us to do both geometry optimizations and molecular dynamics in the linear scaling mode. Uh, so once we have this strict localization, as Terry mentioned, we have sparse matrices. So just to give a couple of examples, this is what the density kernel looks like in this graphene nanoribbon system and also in a, a graphene, uh, the, the system that I showed earlier. Um, and an important thing to emphasize for, for linear scaling codes is that uh, 
we are not automatically cheaper than the cubic scaling approach, but we have some crossover point beyond which the linear scaling approach becomes cheaper. And this crossover is dependent on a number of factors. Um, so particularly the dimensionality of the system. So here you can see in a, a quasi 1D system versus a 2D system, the crossover is much lower in the 1D system than it is in the 2D system, both in time and in memory, although the memory crossover is uh, very, very small in terms of the number of atoms. But this also depends on the support function radio that you choose, which is a, an input parameter for calculations, um, as well as various other convergence parameters that you might use in the calculation. And then finally, this also depends quite strongly on the band gap. So I mentioned that the density matrix decays exponentially in systems with a gap. We can also treat metals uh, if we introduce some small finite temperature using the Fermi operator expansion approach. But again, the crossover in this case does tend to be higher. So what takes most time in our uh, linear scaling calculations? So if we wanted, for example, to reduce this prefactor even further, um, well, it's, it's mainly the support function optimization which dominates this prefactor because we often need to do quite a few steps to converge to well-optimized support functions. But I've already mentioned that uh, the nature of these support functions depends on their local chemical environment. So the question is what happens if we have similar chemical environments? And just to show a, an example of a small water droplet, at least as, as far as the eye can see, the support functions look very similar between different water molecules. So the internal molecular environment is dominating the form that the support functions end up in. So the question is, is there some way we can take advantage of this similarity and reuse support functions if we have similar chemical environments? The answer is yes, um, but there's one challenge that we have to address first, and that's that uh, as this water droplet nicely illustrates, we don't have some case where all the molecules are nightly, neatly lined up in a row where we can just uh, easily replicate the support functions. Instead, we have to particularly account for the fact that we have varying orientations. And so we've implemented an approach where we minimize uh, this cost function. So it's a relatively well-known problem that if you minimize the cost function where we have some rotation matrix between what we call a, a template coordinate system and then a final coordinate system of interest, uh, you can, by minimizing the function, you can find the optimal rotation matrix. And in the case where the molecules are rigid, this cost function gives you a value of zero. In the case where they're not rigid and there's some distortion between the template uh, molecule and the final molecule of interest, then we have a non-zero value for J. But once we've found this rotation, the next step is to apply uh, an interpolation scheme based on wavelets, which is both accurate and efficient. And by doing so, we can go between different orientations of, of water molecules, for example, or whatever our system of interest might be. So if we put these ingredients together, we have what we refer to as a, a molecular fragment approach. So the idea here is that we do a full linear scaling uh, calculation on some template system uh, for, in this case, a single water molecule. And this, uh, at the moment, is typically done for an isolated gas phase molecule, but it could, for example, also be done in an implicit solvent, which you would expect to give a, a better description for the support functions. So we perform this full linear scaling calculation on a small system, which is cheap because it's so small. And then we replicate these optimized uh, support functions across the full system doing this uh, rotor translation process. And then the full calculation is performed using fixed support functions. So for the large system, we can completely eliminate this support function optimization loop. And as I'll show you, this can result in quite significant computational savings for systems where it's appropriate. So the question is, when is it appropriate to use this fragment approach? Uh, so just to give a, a couple of examples of when we shouldn't use it. Uh, so as in this case of a, a water dimer, um, if we use a fragment approach at, at very long distances between the water molecules, then it, it works perfectly. Our error is essentially zero because in this case, they're not interacting. If we go to very, very short distances, we start to have uh, a rather large error creeping in. And this is of course, because we have basis set superposition error that's appearing and our support functions were, were not optimized for the scenario where they're at short distances. So this, uh, the, the size of this error depends on the quantity that you're interested in. So for uh, total energies, uh, the error tends to be larger. If you were interested instead in the density of states, this error tends to be less important. But in general, we should look to use the fragment approach when we have a system with weakly interacting fragments. 
The second thing we need to consider is the effect of distortions. So here I have an example of the molecule 2CZPN, which is a, a, a molecule which is used in organic LEDs, as I'll talk more about uh, shortly. And in this case, we can use the optimized gas phase molecule as a template. Um, but if we were to use some kind of more realistic uh, structure, which has been generated using uh, finite temperature molecular dynamics, you can see that actually the molecule tends to, these subfragments, as we call them, rotate. Uh, we tend to have some distortion. Uh, and so in fact, they don't necessarily resemble very closely the, the template molecule. And the more distorted the fragment, as you might imagine, the larger the error. Um, so I'm showing here what we would have if we would take this molecule and try and find the optimal rotation between the molecule as a whole and each of these other uh, distorted molecules. And you can see that the larger the value of the cost function J, the larger the error. And so the nice thing about this is that we can use uh, this cost function to predict ahead of time whether or not the fragment approach is going to be appropriate for a particular system. If we use a bit more thought, and rather than just taking the single molecule as a, a template, we take the sub fragments, so we divide it into three sub fragments, which are highlighted in the different shades of gray, then we still have some distortion in the sub fragments, but the cost function is much smaller, and therefore so is the error. Uh, so sometimes, uh, in, in general, we want to use fragments which are not too distorted, but we might also have to think beyond the, the idea of simply one molecule being one fragment. Um, but just to share an example of, of how this works in a system which is ideally, ideally suited. So here we have a cluster of uh, rigid molecules of CBP, which is uh, another molecule which is used for OLEDs. Um, and in this case, the, the molecules are rigid, so we don't have any distortions, and they are relatively weakly interacting. So we can see that the fragment approach reduces, uh, reproduces the density of states very well. We also have a, a small error even compared to the cubic scaling approach in terms of the total energy. And if we were to do a 5,000 atom cluster of CBP, we end up with a, a calculation which is about seven times cheaper than, than the linear scaling approach. So really the savings are quite significant for situations where this approach is useful. And the last thing I just want to say about the fragment approach briefly is that we've also generalize this concept to go to extended systems. So it's not just suitable for molecular systems. And in this case, as well as using the cost function, we've also defined what we call the on-site overlap matrix to help us decide whether the approach is appropriate and how we might set up such a calculation. So just an example here of a, a silicon carbide nanotube. If you look by eye, you can see that support functions look very similar in, in the middle of the nanotube. But at the ends of this finite nanotube, we, we start to see some slight differences. And if we calculate the overlap matrix between these support functions by moving them so that they are on the same site, we can see that, that exactly what our eyes are telling us is the case. They're very, very similar in the center um, and they start to deviate at the edges. And so using this, we can come up with this idea of doing a, an embedded uh, pseudo fragment calculation where we can start with a, a small nanotube uh, define some different types of support functions based on uh, distance from the edge, and then use these support functions as a fixed basis for a much longer nanotube. And we've also applied a, a similar concept to uh, graphene with a, a substitutional defect. Uh, so moving on from the, the fragment approach, I want to talk a little bit about some motivating applications for large scale DFT. So one of the things I'm particularly interested in is simulating materials for OLEDs, as you might uh, guess from the, some of the previous examples that I've shown. Uh, so one of the things that we're commonly interested in calculating uh, for OLEDs is parameters that can be used to simulate charge transport, so transport integrals and on-site energies. And as you can see, these OLED materials tend to be uh, very disordered. So the usual procedure is to extract pairs of molecules from some disordered uh, larger system and calculate the transfer integrals just for the pair of molecules. But what we know is that actually the environment uh, in OLEDs can have a particularly strong impact on these parameters. So we'd ideally like to be able to calculate something like this final scenario where we have the transfer integrals calculated in their environment. And for this, we need large systems. So as an example, we've looked at previously is we have uh, a host guest system. So CBP uh, doped with Iridium PPY3 as the guest. And we had some structure which, which was generated in a way that mimics the, the physical vapor deposition process. And then we also use constrained DFT to introduce a charge to the system and allow us to, 
understand the effects of uh, polarization on the on-site energies. And I'm not going to go into any detail, but it's just to show a, a snapshot of the results. So for the transfer integrals, what we find is that we get a, a dispersion in results. We have uh, quite a range of values depending on the orientation and distance between the pairs of molecules. And this actually decays rather slowly with distance. Um, but actually what we don't find for the transfer integrals is the environment doesn't have too much of a difference. And actually we could have more or less uh, taken the, the pair of molecules as they are uh, without taking into account the environment. But this is not true of the on-site energies where not only do we have a dispersion in results, we also have quite a large shift uh, between what we would get if we were to take an isolated molecule and calculate the on-site energy versus the average of what we get if we take into account the environment. And so here, if we want a, a realistic uh, picture of these molecules, it's clear that we do need to take into account the effects of the environment uh, implying large systems. Uh, so going beyond uh, the uh, Iridium PPY3 uh, guest emitter that I showed in this example, the, what's referred to as the next generation of OLEDs uh, want to be something which is more sustainable. So instead of relying on Iridium and Platinum, which are uh, expensive and bad for the environment, we want to use instead a process called thermally activated delayed fluorescence, which uh, can be employed in uh, purely organic molecules like the 2CZPN example I've already shown, and is also a very efficient process. And so taking a, a snapshot of this 2CZPN molecule, uh, using the linear scaling approach in BigDFT, we're, we're able to see the difference between the density of states with an optimized gas phase molecule versus averaging over um, different uh, configurations of the 2CZPN molecule versus what happens if we would actually calculate the density of states in a large cluster. But going beyond the ground state, we're also interested in exciting states, which are particularly important for TADF molecules. So in particular, they need to have a small singlet triplet splitting, uh, which allows this process of reverse inter-system crossing, uh, which is thermally activated, and this allows the, the TADF uh, emission to happen. But one of the complications of uh, excited states in, in TADF molecules is that we tend to have a mix of charge transfer and local excitations. And usually the typical uh, method used to calculate uh, the excited states is TDDFT. Um, but for, for one, this can be relatively expensive uh, for large systems. Um, and two, this has issues with long range charge transfer states, which are a relatively well known problem which can be uh, to some extent fixed by using range separated hybrid functionals, which are tuned to the system, but this uh, adds another layer of cost and some extra parameters to tune. So instead we're interested in using constrained DFT, which is, uh, has a much lower cost than TDDFT and is also known to be able to treat long wage charge transfer excitations. So just to show an example of this ZMBCBC complex, at least qualitatively that you can see that the uh, charge transfer state from CDDF, CDFT looks very similar to what we would get from many body perturbation theory. But since we need to be able to treat charge transfer and local excitations in TADF molecules, the question is, can we do something for locally excited states? So in the, the charge transfer case, we have some spatial constraint that we impose. So we're uh, exciting or moving electrons from one spatial region to another, in this case, one molecule to another. For the locally excited states, we've been implementing a new method where we instead impose a constraint between the orbitals. So in this case, we uh, move uh, one electron between the HOMO of the mo molecule and uh, put this electron into the LUMO and use this as our definition of the constraint. Uh, we're still doing a few benchmarks at the moment, but just to take the example of the, the 2CZPM molecule, if we assume a, a pure transition, so it's just a, a transition between the HOMO and LUMO, and we use the cubic scaling wave functions as a basis, uh, we've been comparing against a, a number of different results. So here is our constrained DFT result calculated with PBE. Um, we've also done delta SCF with three functionals and TDDFT with three functionals. And there's no perfect reference to compare to. Um, so uh, for, for the moment, we've taken some uh, TDDFT results with tuned range separated functionals as our reference. And you can see that what's particularly nice is that constrained DFT doesn't suffer from this drastic uh, underestimation of the charge transfer like energies that you get with TDDFT. So we have something which is uh, much more reasonable, but still with using a semi-local functional. And if we compare two experiments, so both the 
TDDFT and experimental results were measured in toluene, so this might introduce some uncertainty. Uh, but we get a, a reasonably good agreement also for the singlet triplet splitting, although we tend to be underestimating it a little bit. Um, so just to wrap up my section, um, so as we've now seen uh, in big DFT, we have a range of methods for treating different length scales from the, the cubic scaling extended orbital approach to the linear scaling localized orbital approach to the fragment approach, which in certain systems uh, where we have weakly interacting, not too distorted fragments, we can significantly reduce the prefactor. And then we can also, as Luigi mentioned, do explicit, uh, implicit solvent calculations as well. Um, but as we go to larger systems, we start to have more complex uh, calculations, both in terms of setting up the calculations and interpreting and understanding the results uh, of our simulations. And the question is, is there some way that we can make these calculations more tractable? Can we extract more information from them or can we re somehow reduce the complexity of these complex calculations? And to answer that question, I'm going to hand over to William. Okay, thank you, Laura. So, oh, there we go. So I, I'm gonna begin uh, with uh, asking you guys a question. So in the previous talks, we've presented how in the big DFT code, we can compute uh, very large systems, particularly by exploiting these order n algorithms. And, but uh, I would be lying to you if I told you this was, we had the only code that had this capability. Um, in fact, there are many other codes that for many years have had the ability to perform calculations on systems with tens of thousands of atoms. And yet, while there are those papers out there and those codes out there, I imagine that many of you, if you think about the research articles that you've read in your particular field, you might find it hard to think of examples of where somebody has used this capability and perform the DFT calculation on such a big system for real scientific results. So what is, what it, why is that? Why is this uh, kind of capability not used all the time? Well, there are two issues with these kinds of calculations. The first one I would call an enthalpy challenge, where we have to remember that DFT functionals are not necessarily more accurate than a well-tuned force field for certain types of systems. And the second is an entropy challenge where we have to remember that with a very large system, it can take on many different conformations. And this means that you would need to do calculations on many different snapshots of a system in order to really explore the dynamics of it. So with this in mind, uh, we have to remember that DFT calculations can't be applied to big systems just thinking to yourself, well, it's more accurate because you might worry about the accuracy of your functional, and second, because it's very expensive to do calculations on such large uh, data sets of snapshots. But instead of thinking about DFT in terms of accuracy, in this talk, I would like you to think about performing DFT calculations in order to get new kinds of insight into your system. And I'll show you how we do that with our big DFT code. So in order to get insight, from our calculations, we're going to look to the density matrix. Now, the other speakers have uh, presented a more formal definition of the density matrix, but for this talk, I'd like to keep things simple. We're going to ignore the overlap matrix and just think of the density matrix as being that sort of outer product matrix K. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm moving it there on that K, built from the uh, concham coefficients. But what is the density matrix actually? Well, there are many ways to interpret it, but mathematically speaking, we can think of the density matrix as a projection matrix, and particularly a projection onto the occupied orbitals. And because of this, we know that it fulfills two conditions. The first is that the trace of the density matrix should be equal to the number of electrons, of course, uh, ignoring factors of two, depending on how you would like to treat spin. And the second is a more abstract uh, kind of concept, which is that it should be idempotent. And this means if you take the density matrix and you multiply it by itself, it should stay the same. 
So with this in mind, let's consider a system which I show right here. And in this system, I've taken it and I've divided the atoms into two sets, the orange set and the blue set. And what we're going to do is we're going to call those sets fragments. So here we have fragment one and fragment two. Now, because in the big DFT code, we use atom-centered support functions, because we do that, this means that we can partition the density matrix itself into four blocks, guided by those sort for support functions in which atoms they're associated with. So what we end up, is, up with is that we had that big density matrix before, and then in the top left is a sub-density matrix associated with fragment one, in the bottom right, a subdensity matrix associated with fragment two. However, while I call these subdensity matrices, they're not really density matrices in the sense that they no longer fulfill the two conditions I showed before. They're no longer idempotent and the trace has changed. Now it's actually a problem that these matrices are not idempotent because it means means that they are no longer good projections and we can't localize orbitals completely onto fragment one or fragment two. And so what we decided to do was to define a normalized measure of how good these fragments are, uh, not, uh, not, sorry, how much we deviate from idempotency. And we call this measure the purity indicator. And it is defined like this here. And it's very simple. We just do that expression I showed before to check if it's idempotent, and we divide by the number of electrons to normalize it. And I plotted down here various values of the purity indicator taken from the amino acid fragments of this small protein. And you will see indeed that no longer are those subdensity matrices idempotent. Yeah, there's significant error there. And where does this come from? Well, it comes from the off-diagonal parts of the matrix, which we neglected when we performed this multiplication. So let's look a little bit closer at what, that, what happened there. So if we try to compute the purity indicator, uh, in this case, I've multiplied by the number of electrons for simplicity. So if we want to compute it, well, we can actually compute it using the definition of block matrix multiplication because of course I had divided up the density matrix into the blocks. And using that definition and removing the terms that don't contribute, we get this kind of expression down here. And quite interestingly, we see that the purity indicator of the full system is equal to the purity indicator of one fragment plus the purity indicator of another fragment. And then these middle coupling terms, which I've labeled B, and you see these middle coupling terms are based only on the off-diagonal elements. And so we will decide to uh, kind of measure these values here, and we will name them the fragment bond order. Okay, so in this talk, I've so far introduced two definitions. And so let's review. The first one was the purity indicator. And I would argue that the purity indicator is a measure of fragment quality. And the reason for this argument is that it is a measure of how good of a projection we can do. Because this measure comes from our measuring of the error in idempotency. The second term I introduced was the fragment bond order. And I would argue that this is a measure of fragment interaction. This term comes from the off diagonal terms that were neglected when you do that kind of expansion. And thus, it represents a coupling between two different fragments. And together in this talk, I'm going to present a concept which we call complexity reduction, which is where, where we use these two terms in order to divide large complex systems into chemically meaningful fragments and to measure their interaction. And I think, in fact, this framework I'm going to present here is quite different than what you normally see in a DFT talk. And just as an aside, uh, for those of you who know your history, both of these terms are quite closely connected to some classical concepts. The purity indicator is closely connected to atomic valence and the fragment bond order to the standard atomic bond order. So what can we do with these two indicators, to, uh, these two measures together? Well, the first thing we can do is we can divide up systems into chemically meaningful fragments. 
And to do that is quite simple. We just pick some cutoff, which we find uh, for the purity indicator, which we consider small enough. And then you can start from the atoms of some arbitrary molecule and apply some optimization algorithm, which groups together the atoms. And once we have found a grouping for which all the groups fulfill that criteria, we have now an automatically partitioned molecule. We can in fact do this on large biomolecules as well, not just on small ones. We could do it from the atoms up, or we might start with some predefined fragments, such as the amino acids of the system. Now, of course, we know that while amino acids are one way to divide up a protein, perhaps they are not equally good fragments as each other. And thus we can imply this optimization, which will combine amino acids as we've done here. You see the, uh, where two colors are the same if they are combined in order to create a more, more coherent picture of the system. And what I've done here in, those previous, in that previous slide is not an arbitrary partitioning. In fact, we are doing reliable partitioning by using the purity indicator. And to demonstrate this, I have an example here where we have a large protein system and we would like to compute some kind of property of it. For example, the density of states. Now, of course, we can do this in big DFT using a full calculation, but of course it would be much cheaper if we could instead divide up the system into small fragments, compute the density of states of each of those small fragments via an, inter, uh, an independent small calculation and then add it up to the full one. And so what we did in this case is starting from the atoms, we divided our system up into fragments using different cutoffs. And I think you can see that as we tighten that cutoff, we get closer and closer to the actual result from the full calculation. And thus we see we have a way to imp systematically improve our fragments. Now, one other thing we can do with our complexity reduction framework is to automatically define embedding environments of systems. And to demonstrate this, I have an example where we have a particular protein, in this case, the main protease of SARS-CoV-2, and it's in complex with a small inhibitor. And what we can do is we might want to, we, we might be interested in producing a picture like this, where we have the three different uh, amino uh, three different fragments of the inhibitor, and we want to know which amino acids of the protein it interacts strongly with. Well, to do that, we can look through the fragment bond order. All we have to do is we compute, we just try to compute the minimum set of fragments such that the sum of the remaining bond order is below some threshold. And that gives us an embedding environment automatically. And this too is a reliable embedding. And to demonstrate this, I will show an example here. In this case, the property we wish to compute is the projected density of states of some arbitrary fragment from our system. Using the approach shown here, we find the strongly interacting fragments with our target. And we use that to construct a buffer region so that we can compute a small cluster calculation where we have the target and we have a small buffer region based on this kind of approach. And as you see, as we decrease the cutoff of the bond order, growing and growing the buffer region, we're able to reproduce that property. And so that brings me to the end of my talk. And I would just like to summarize. So as I said in the beginning, when you try to use DFT on large systems, I hope you think not just in terms of accuracy, but instead wonder how can I develop methods with DFT, which give me more insight into systems. And in this talk, I presented our complexity reduction framework, which is a way which does aims to do just that, where we use the results of DFT calculations in big DFT to generate these coarse grained views of systems, where we have reliably defined fragments and we have a measure of their interaction. And this whole framework is available uh, through our Pi Big DFT package. Augustan will talk more about that in the next part of, in the next talk. But I would just finish by saying that post-processing and uh, defining these kinds of things can all be done on a typical workstation, just using the results of the Big DFT calculation. And of course, if this appears useful for you, I hope you will get in touch with us because we would love to collaborate. And with that, I'm finished. Thank you.
So thank you, Laura and William. Uh, uh, as I already anticipated in the beginning, uh, there should be the time for some Q&A. There has been already some questions answered in the, in the appropriate uh, chat panel. So if uh, you think uh, it is suitable in the interest of time, I would uh, suggest uh, Augustin to take over for the last part of okay. our Can webinar. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. Okay. Hello. There you go, yes. Just start. It's better. Um, okay, so I will talk quickly about the different ways to get Big DFT to compile it and uh, what we are doing to uh, make it easier now to uh, to use than uh, than it was a couple of years ago. So Big DFT is actually an increasingly uh, large amount of uh, internal libraries now because it's quite modular, and it, the Big DFT package itself is. Uh, comprised of like 12 to 18 different modules, depending on what you want to compile. So these modules are separated in few parts, like uh, the, uh, the main, the yellow ones that we see on the, on the left are actually the uh, main big DFT packages. And you have third parties libraries that are being used. You have also upstream modules, the blue ones that can be used that, and that we, are, um, we have a dependency graph that is quite important. So how do you compile this? Uh, for this, uh, we have a, a bundler based on ghbuild that uh, will uh, take a configuration file, a Python configuration file, and uh, try to uh, see on your system what is installed, what is available, pull what is not available, compile every single like, different libraries, and in the end, uh, prepare uh, the, uh, the package you want for big BFT. So this is quite... Uh, uh, a very vers versatile system to build a uh, big DFT. And it's quite, uh, it can be very easy to do because we can uh, share the configuration files uh, in different, uh, between systems. And uh, we, we provide a lot of different configuration files for very different use cases, but also for end users, it can be quite cumbersome to, uh, to, to do this uh, configuration file for a new system, for instance. Uh, and when some uh, issue arise, uh, it can be quite tough to uh, to see where exactly uh, the issue arise. So the bundler will provide will um, output uh, lots of uh, log files from the build and tell exactly where the, the problem arise. But uh, in, for some users, it can be quite uh, quite difficult still. So we want to. Uh, still keep the modularity of big dft while making it uh, easier for users to uh, deploy and use on uh, on various systems so for that uh, the the alternatives we want to uh, to provide are to provide package version for instance on uh, debian systems with a simple uh, apt get install you could have a big dft uh, virtual machines that can be provided to uh, already provide the full environment uh, running uh, running big DFT and also containers which can be deployed easily on different systems on different platforms and HPC platforms so that you can run easily big DFT. But for users, uh, we actually have different kinds of users. Uh, the developers, for instance, they will want uh, a development environment that is reproducible and will, be, will help them uh, develop easily on different systems and to reproduce issues on different platforms as well and to, uh, and to see what, what could be uh, an issue on, let's say, a new Ubuntu version or uh, with a new CUDA version. We want to provide HPC, uh, uh, HPC uh, runtime uh, versions for big DFT that are very fast and will, uh, will yield uh, the same performance as a, a compiled version on the, on, the, on the cluster. And we also want analysis tools such as PYBigDFT uh, to be available for users uh, uh, and, uh, and not to uh, force users to compile a full version of BigDFT just to get the analysis tools, uh, which can be actually split up and, uh, and used on uh, your laptop and not on your, your uh, uh, the HPC system, for instance. So this led us to, uh, to, to, 
to, to have these kind of requirements for our uh, containers. So they must include a lot of system packages, which are for the build mainly, but Python, CMake, because our bundler will bundle a lot of different uh, libraries, which will uh, have themselves uh, a build system that is different. So the, and the bundler will handle the, uh, the work, but still uh, you need the dependencies. Uh, the linear algebra packages uh, uh, also needs to be available. And for instance, the MKL, that, which is not really uh, if simply to install on any computer uh, as is. So it can be uh, a, a dependency that we want to use. And so it will, be, it will have to be provided in the containers. Uh, the upstream packages, the community packages that are uh, also uh, necessary and uh, that can be pulled by the, by the bundler should be uh, in the container as well and the big DH packages. And we want that with also uh, HPC uh, setups such as CUDA to be uh, installed on the container. We want also uh, an MPI uh, library, which is CUDA aware, so that we can use GPU di direct technology from NVIDIA to uh, have different uh, nodes communicating uh, through each other, such as GPUs are actually directly communicating, communicating to each other. And we also want uh, the workstation and front end to have uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, available and Jupyter servers uh, inside the container so that you can uh, actually run work, uh, workflows from uh, anywhere. So uh, this means that in the container, we have all these, uh, all these available features. And uh, we provide for this, uh, two different containers, which are the SDK one, which is a large, uh, a larger container uh, containing all of uh, all, all that is needed to build big DFT, but not big DFT itself. Uh, this container is the one used for our CI integration system and for uh, uh, for different uh, developments so that uh, it can build the, the, uh, the, the big DFT versions that are used in the runtime system, the runtime container. The runtime container here, so the links will be available on the, uh, on the PDF, uh, is a stripped version uh, which only has the big DFT and MPI libraries generated with all dependencies needed for a HPC run. This container is also available in uh, NVIDIA uh, repository to uh, use on uh, cloud platforms and, uh, and uh, the available NVIDIA platforms uh, on, this, uh, on this side. So we use these containers to develop uh, GPU acceleration for exact exchange and to use also PY to, uh, to test PYDB DFT setups. So it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite used now. So how do we do uh, these containers? They are built using uh, NVIDIA HPC Container Maker Toolkit, which is uh, a way to build containers uh, dynamically through uh, Python scripts. And that will uh, help you uh, generate containers uh, that have uh, common blocks, such as uh, CUDA, MKL, uh, building uh, li MPI libraries with several sets of features if needed, install Jupyter and, uh, and such. So for instance, uh, we, we provide uh, several flavors depending on the CUDA uh, version and the uh, MPI version you want. We have an MVA pitch flavor and open MPI flavor, which both work with GPUs. They also, uh, these containers also work on non-GPU system, even if the code inside is compiled with GPU uh, support. So you don't need to have, to have several, uh, several flavors for that. Uh, we provide an ARM, uh, ARM version of the containers as well, uh, with GPUs as well. Uh, so uh, even if that's not tested yet, but it should work. Uh, so that it's future proof for some platforms that we didn't test on yet. It even works on Windows uh, with GPUs using the latest uh, WSL2 uh, versions. Uh, so that's quite neat for one single compilation to be working on uh, such an array of, uh, of systems. Um, for instance, and uh, some neat features you can have with the containers is you actually handle the packaging. So actually, BigDFT is not compiled once in the runtime system, but it's compiled three times because we have three different versions with or without vectorized instructions and uh, in, uh, using features of recent glibc we can, uh, well, 
actually the, the system will select uh, co correctly the uh, best version for uh, the running uh, processor. So it doesn't know uh, exactly which, uh, which version to use and it checks uh, with the processor what it supports and it will take the correct, uh, the correct libraries and, uh, and, uh, and use the, the most optimized one for the processor. So that's quite neat. And for the users, it's, uh, it's uh, actually a gain of performance. So it has been tested on various platforms and various uh, HPC systems uh, with uh, Singularity and Shifter. And uh, I can't remember exactly the name of the one that is replacing uh, Shifter and Danes, but it's been tested in that hours since as well. Um, and to run it, uh, it's just uh, quite standard uh, Docker run, uh, but you can use NVIDIA Docker or you can use Docker to run it uh, with, uh, as we see, you can just uh, load a folder with your uh, input files in it, uh, go to this folder with W and then run the container with big DFT, or you can just run MPI run uh, uh, NP uh, as many as you want. Uh, because there is MPI inside the container as well to use on the nodes. So more than the containers, we also, uh, we are part of the uh, Max flagship codes. So uh, we made a big DFT available on the quantum mobile virtual machine where, where we have a version that is uh, obviously less optimized and without GPUs and uh, without everything in, in the, in the in the virtual machine, but it's a great tool for uh, testing big DFT and uh, for training schools and uh, and uh, and such usages that are uh, quite uh, on your laptop. You can uh, you can use this uh, this quantum uh, quantum mobile uh, virtual machine very easily to uh, to test different codes and uh, big DFT is part of that now. There's the Debian package I was talking about uh, will be provided in the next release of uh, Big DFT, I think. And uh, it should be uh, the same thing, a very easy to install, but less optimized version of Big DFT, but it will be available soon. Uh, and there is the, um, the analysis package we are uh, doing, which will be a stripped version of PYBigDFT and Futile and the Python tools that are needed to our analyzing Big DFT runs. Uh, and this will be uh, uh, probably a pip package uh, in the, uh, that will be available soon uh, uh, to, uh, to, to allow us to split the big DFT from the analysis tools. So for uh, in uh, in Max, uh, we also uh, use uh, IDA now in, with big DFT and uh, for uh, but since 2016, we've been using uh, PYBigDFT as a way to launch calculations on, uh, on, this, uh, on some platform and some uh, notebooks and to do the analysis after the runs. So for instance, we have these kind of constructs, which were the system calculators, which is quite an equivalent to the IDA catch job, except that it will only run jobs locally. So uh, you needed just to import from Big DFT some, uh, some parts and then to create a system calculator, then to load the input, to create an input file uh, from Python construct as well. And you could set up uh, the, the options you wanted and, uh, and then uh, run the computation uh, easily. So that was uh, the easiest way to use Big DFT uh, we had. And uh, you could even package these system calculators inside uh, inside data sets, which were the equivalents of some workflows, so that you could have several uh, computation run uh, sequentially, and then uh, you can uh, analyze every single one of them in the end by fetching the results and then getting uh, getting all the data you needed. And we wanted to, uh, when porting uh, Big DFT uh, to IDA, we wanted to keep this way of using uh, Big DFT so that we could uh, still use our uh, workflows and uh, the Python notebooks that were uh, available, but uh, with using the uh, IDA features. So the IDA plugin for Big DFT actually uh, has two ways of being used. The traditional flavor, with this, uh, which is uh, the main uh, IDA use use case, is to make IDA workflows with IDA uh, 
IDA, uh, with IDA computation, IDA calculation, and uh, to submit them to big uh, to, to, to to the HPC systems or to local uh, local runners and get the results and analyze them through uh, through IDA or to use PYBigDFT uh, with IDA. So PYBigDFT is actually uh, included in the IDA BigDFT uh, plugin. Uh, so it will uh, it's available to uh, to analyze runs even from an, a pure IDA uh, workflow. But we wanted to use uh, our uh, notebooks as well. So uh, we have this uh, neat feature that is the IDA calculator that is instead of the system calculator we saw before, uh, just replace it with an IDA calculator. You can say, okay, I want to run it on uh, Dane, for instance. So let's load the code that is BigFT at Dane. We want to use 128 nodes with uh, OpenMP and MPI and, uh, and run it. And then you can just, uh, so the, the run command is not here, but you can just run it as a, as a system calculator and it will create the IDA calculations that are needed uh, through the big DFT plugin and submit them. And uh, then you can just wait for them. And with Jupyter Notify, you get a neat notification when, uh, when your uh, notebook has finished this cell. So you get, uh, you even get a notification when all the submitted jobs uh, have finished running. So you can submit uh, end computation this way and uh, get the results. So from your laptop, you can actually control uh, big DFT on, uh, on uh, HPC systems without, uh, without a hassle. So everything is uh, integrated and uh, uh, and pure big DFT, we have the way of launching this, uh, this computation. So it's now a console to launch, uh, uh, to launch uh, big DFT. And uh, for this, actually, we wanted to provide another container, which is uh, a console container, which will uh, be the, um, how to control the remote systems and uh, to launch the computations on different systems without, uh, you know, without installing anything locally and without, uh, without configuring it for hours. So uh, we had the requirements of uh, installing everything that was a database related, uh, working uh, on a separate environment, such as a virtual machine or a container with a separate uh, environment. Or, uh, and the configuration of the remote machine still has to do done manually at some point. So for that, uh, we have the console container, which is available since a few, a few weeks now. It's based on uh, IDALAB container, so it actually comes with IDA installed, IDALAB installed as well, that uh, helps you uh, use IDA uh, more graphically. Uh, and it comes with uh, big DFT plugins, PY big DFT, the analysis tools, and uh, everything you could need to uh, run, uh, run computations. It has Jupyter as well. So this is uh, the go-to container to launch computations uh, that are on other, uh, other remote systems. And uh, for this, you can, uh, uh, and you can even launch containers on uh, remote systems if you want uh, <laughs> this way. Uh, so you don't need to install anything on this one. You don't need CUDA, you don't need NPI because you're just running the, the uh, launch and analysis tools. And it's, uh, it's quite important to have this now. Uh, it's a real control center for uh, the experiments. And a uh, and quick, uh, quick uh, perspective, and, uh, and I will uh, leave uh, Luigi to, uh, to finish. Uh, the benchmarking uh, for, for instance, with this control control concept, console container can be launched very easily. So for instance, last week, uh, I've run uh, some computation using uh, these, uh, uh, these, these features on the uh, IRAN platform uh, we had using the IDALAB console container and just getting the results and the, the analysis through PYBDFT really easily and seeing that we had some network slowdown issues at some point uh, after uh, some skating. And uh, this really was uh, a few minutes to set up and launch for uh, this platform. So it was really, uh, really easy and neat to, uh, to have these tools now to, uh, to, to be able to analyze runs and, uh, and uh, to get results and, uh, very easily. So we have a new, uh, a new, new work being done on Fugaku as well, uh, so that we have the ARM uh, 
the ARM version with, with, which will use SV uh, vectorization for the libconv uh, con uh, convolution uh, library, which is being developed. So we still need to do some optimization. For instance, we have some very preliminary work uh, on Fugaku done uh, a few weeks ago, and we are seeing a lot of really not great, not great uh, performance right now, but it's uh, it will be uh, the the kind of work that we will do in the forthcoming weeks or months to try to get better results on this one. Because, for instance, we can see the blue part here, which is uh, internal futile uh, uh, operations, which shouldn't take one third of the time. And when you when you click on it, so you can actually see that it's. Uh, 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 profiling that is taking most of the time so that's not great that the profiling itself is taking one third of the time so that's uh, but that's uh, a problem we have on uh, on, uh, on fugaku that will be uh, debugged soon it's very preliminary and nothing can be uh, uh, extracted from this right now we will we'll have to to investigate and i will leave luigi uh, for the next part Luigi, I think you are muted. We can't hear you. You are right. Thank you, Francesco. <laughs> Sorry. So um, that uh, is uh, uh, my last in uh, contribution here. I thank you all for your kind attention. And I would like to just wrap up uh, the main messages that we have been trying to convey during this webinar. So as we have seen, the main idea that drive uh, us, drove us into big DFT project is the idea of testing the advantages of this new formalism, which were, was new in 2005. And now it is still alive and well. And we have had the possibility to test new ideas and have interesting results. So the main idea is that we have been trying ourselves to ask ourselves questions like the one which is highlighted in red here. Why should one treat large systems with DFT? And I believe that Laura's and William talk will have tried to address to some, quant to some point. So the idea of being able to treat large systems is eventually the fact that we need to shift our investigation paradigm. At the given moment, we couldn't deal with large DFT systems as if we were dealing with one molecules or few molecules. So the main idea we have been trying at present to investigate is whether we can ploy the insights of DFT to understand the information about the constituent, the way to model the constituent's interaction of a given system, and in any case, to go towards descriptions that are still DFT-based, but with a reduced complexity. But of course, this is only one of the possibilities of the DFT approach in these formalism. Another point that Augustine pointed, uh, another problem is the maintenance of the parallel performances into new emerging architectures. And for these, what we have been doing in the last 10 years, of course, is just a starting point. New architectures are upcoming. The solutions we have found may need to be improved. And we are referring to the collaborations between our COE, the Max COE, and the POP COE to uh, uh, have ideas on how to optimize our algorithms in order to uh, have good performance on new emerging architecture. So this is a definitely a second panel of challenges that we need to address for such kind of problems. In any case, the point is exactly to have a kind of a hierarchy of methods that can be tuned by the user by the scientific uh, problem at hand, and uh, in such a way to provide the good level of complexity to the problem we would like to, to analyze. 
So uh, uh, an example may be one of the systems that Augustin just shown. So the systems that have been shown by Augustin is a monocular antibody. So it's a system of a 20,000 atom uh, 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 sides, uh, we may wonder uh, how to model the strength of the interactors between uh, uh, the fragments of these systems so we can deal eventually by post-processing the calculations of big DFT with pi big DFT with AIDA, uh, we can deal with quantities like the interaction maps between the main fragments of the systems and if you have followed the uh, discussion presented by William. This is on the same uh, uh, spirit. Of course, this opens new challenges and we are presently uh, contributing uh, uh, for the best of what we can also to the COVID emergency. We are in contact with the various groups that are interested in understanding how the interactors of the system can, of the, the, the main COVID emergency related systems can uh, somehow be modeled. And that's once again, in order to have insights that come from the simulation from DFT onto such kind of, uh, of complicated and challenging uh, systems. So uh, some of the questions I have been asked during, uh, we have been asked during the webinar are related to tutorials and uh, uh, somehow users experience. So uh, we could say that now we are now in a, uh, 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 in a third phase of the big DFT project after the initial part, which, which was uh, driving us towards the development of the Vichy's wavelets in DFT. And the second part, which deals with large systems, I, uh, uh, I think that we are now in the third part where we have already identified algorithmic solutions that are robust and can be already employed for end users uh, that would like to somehow try them for new investigations. So we are actually developing, thanks to the, the next mall, company, uh, we are actually developing uh, a, a new set of ideas, a new visual identity, which will also go in line with a new website in which we would like to explain a little more in detail uh, what we are now doing since a few years in terms of how to trigger workflows, how to employ notebooks for calculations and post-processing, and uh, provide tutorials for those who may be interesting in doing this, this interested in doing what we are presently doing with, uh, with this formalism. So that's my last slide. So uh, this approach of uh, having uh, uh, precision, flexibility, and uh, uh, robustness would enable us to uh, test different uh, approaches and uh, uh, open possibilities of investigation that uh, we, we cannot, in principle, address with uh, traditional DFT-based formalisms. We have our priorities in terms of scientific interests. And uh, of course, uh, these priorities can be modeled if you believe that there may be scientific questions and problems that can be addressed effectively by such kind of formalism. So uh, our last slide is about the acknowledgement. Uh, uh, we have, we of course cannot uh, 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 avoid to thank all the contributors, which is beyond the big DFT product, uh, project, and especially the group of Stefan Gedecker in Basel that has been at the origin of all these adventure and uh, uh, that uh, uh, made uh, possible some of the main ideas which lied beyond the development of our uh, uh, algorithms in these uh, in these ten more than ten years. I thank you for your attention. I know we are uh, slightly over time, uh, and uh, I uh, I believe uh, that uh, you there are some some questions. So I will try to answer uh, uh, live. So, is it possible to use big DFT to calculate magnetic properties? Uh, we have for two D materials. We have uh, a um, collinear implementation uh, with the spins that works with all the flavors of uh, big DFT. We also have non-collinear 
implementation of uh, big dft uh, that uh, uh, still uh, works also with surface boundary condition yet uh, for uh, operators like uh, spin orbit coupling and uh, the treatment of magnetic materials uh, with uh, the pseudo potentials we use we employ in big dft we have little experience so uh, it is something that is potentially possible uh, uh, to do, uh, uh, but uh, we didn't focus to such kind of uh, scientific topic uh, in the recent years. Um, about the uh, supercell definition in a surface, an interface, boundary condition like, yes, of course, one can compose different quantum mechanical treatment. And we have this idea of having a QM, QM approach where frozen degrees of freedoms can be placed at will uh, in a given part of the simulation domain and can be employed so to somehow have an effective passivation of the degrees of freedom in the bulk. Uh, this is something that uh, could be developed more easily with uh, the API of Big DFT we have in mind to develop for the next years, where the building blocks of the code can be composed at the level of a high level language like Python or Lua. That is uh, definitely something we are uh, willing to, to, to develop for our own purposes, but also for purposes that may be interesting uh, to you. Um, and we are, of course, available uh, to discussions, uh, questions, comments, uh, in case uh, you would like to dig a little more into these, uh, I would say, fascinating scenario and flexibilities that uh, offer flexibilities that wavelets provide. Once again, thank you. Spin orbit coupling implemented? Not yet, but it's possible. Yes, we never had to implement a spin orbit coupling, but uh, yes, this is something not available at present. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you will enjoy the rest of the day as you have enjoyed this seminar. <laughs> Bye, everyone.